Hi folks, my name is Dr. Kartik and I'm with Vast Data. It's, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you a very, very interesting topic in artificial intelligence, which is the around the idea of explainable AI. Now, what exactly is explainable AI? Typically machine learning models, especially these days with neural networks and convolutional neural networks, which are used extensively for machine learning and deep learning, are rather opaque in the sense that they have data that they're exposed to, these models, and they make predictions, but it's often difficult to understand why a particular model made that particular kind of prediction. Now, in many cases, this may not be that serious. Like if you have a recommendation engine, like in your favorite streaming service like Netflix, uh, which may come up with a recommendation for a movie that it thinks it should see, but it gets it wrong, that's not a problem. This is a far more serious problem in areas such as, say, autonomous driving, where an incorrect prediction could result in an accident and loss of life, life or other things like that. In this particular case, the topic of discussion, which I'll introduce towards the end of my little segment here, is around advanced detection of threats to national security. And this is some research which has been done by the Air Force Research Laboratory at the Maui High Performance Computing Center. And you'll see a lot of variants of this kind of a theme coming by. Neural network models tend to be opaque. And when you have predictions made, users are left with a lot of questions in their mind as to why that prediction was actually made. You want a human in the loop to make a decision on whether that prediction is something which is actionable or that's a prediction that doesn't hold water because a human has broader scope uh, around what the nature of the incident is than, than someone else. So a traditional AI model would literally start with training data, train the model, and you start to use that model for inference and expose to new data, make a prediction. Users have questions like, why did you do that? Or why not something else? Or when, when are you right? When are you wrong? When do I know I can trust you? And if you did make a mistake, how do I know how to correct that error? Explainable AI literally puts a framework together for these models so we can translate the machine predictions into human understandable terms for what kind of prediction is made. Therefore, now the human in the loop, the analyst in this particular case, understands why that prediction was made and when to actually trust the model, when not to trust the model. So this work was done really by the, the, by the researchers of, of, a, uh, of a program called Peacock, which you'll hear about a lot more in this conversation in really derives from a very core observation we are seeing in modern technology right now, which is that we're moving from a transactional world to one where we have aggregates of data. And the value of the aggregate starts to far exceed the value of just the transactional information in here. A single incident could be, say, a network log, which shows the connection between two endpoints in the IP address space. Now when taken in aggregate, now we can start to really analyze patterns to find out what may or may not be happening and whether that's something they should pay attention to. So why is a platform like Vast Data important for something like this? And this is quite simply put the realization that for this kind of large scale analysis, you need access to all your data and which makes Flash a very natural platform to be able to, you know, to be able to store your data. Fast Data is an all Flash platform, and I'll speak about some of the details at this point uh, in a second. So our concept for storage is something we refer to as universal storage. As an all Flash platform, it has the ability to be able to do very, very high performance random access to all the data that's necessary for virtually any task, be it transactional or analytical or machine learning, or deep learning, even backup and archive cases are fine. Its architecture is unique. It is a shared everything architecture. It's one of the first in the industry which breaks any kind of scale limitations in the architecture. 
We have no cache coherency anywhere in the cluster. We have no east-west traffic, and this allows us to scale to tens, even hundreds of, or thousands of, uh, of, uh, of thousands of petabytes of storage. And this makes it a very, very resilient architecture at scale without losing any performance as you scale in this whole system. One of the key things about this platform is we have probably the most economical all flash platform in the industry today. This is because of a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons is because we are able to use highly dense quad level cell technologies to be able to persist the data. And we use a combination of this and storage class memory to completely reduce the cost footprint for something like this. And this gives a very high performing, very high scale, low cost uh, platform, which is perfect for artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning workloads. The overall performance for our systems is incredible. We are, have the ability to expose this through object and file protocols. In this particular case, we've actually tested with the DGXA100 at the NVIDIA RAP Lab in San Jose. And we were able to achieve groundbreaking performance for an NFS file system, uh, 175 gigabytes per second for a single mount point for a single client using RDMA as a transport layer for NFS between the storage platform and, and the, the DGX client that we were connected to. So this now forms the basis for the research that the Air Force Research Laboratory at the Maui High Performance Computing Center uh, is doing their research on. And this is something that is, is as a platform, this is very, very, we can use this for a variety of use cases. In this particular case, of course, we're happy and honored and privileged to be part of something that defends our country as we go forward. So I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Wesley Emenecker, uh, who's, uh, who's one of the principal scientists who's been working on this, and he will be taking you through the rest of this talk. And Wesley works at what they refer to as the Peacock, which is the Pacific Ecosystem for Cyber, and he will describe both the program, but more specifically, he will be showing you how to use anomaly detection techniques. Uh, some of the techniques he'll be talking about are local outlier factors, as well as isolation forests to be able to detect anomalous security events. But more interestingly, he's gonna be talking about how to make those incident predictions explainable in the context of explainable AI. So it's a fascinating topic. I hope you have a fantastic time listening to this talk. I've learned a lot about the topic from Wesley, and I'm looking forward to you getting the same from that as well. Thank you very much, and I hope to meet again soon. Thanks, Kartik. I'm Dr. Wesley Amenecker. I'm the Principal Data Scientist at the Maui High Performance Computing Center. Today, I'm here to talk a little bit about our work in cybersecurity, helping, uh, helping network defenders find and remediate novel network threats. Uh, the work I'm presenting um, uses vast storage for a lot of our big data, high-speed data needs. So the title of our talk is Feature Evaluation of Anomaly Detection Models for Cyber Data. I did this work with, with Dr. Jeremy Young, Dr. Rob Trevino, and I'm Dr. Wesley Amenecker. So the first thing, uh, the most important thing is how to pronounce our project name. It's pronounced Peacock. And I'd like to motivate our talk just a little bit to tell you, to, like, to give you some context to understand why we're doing the things we're doing and how these things make a difference for network defense. So first, we're trying to make defensive cyber operations better and easier. That's the DCO, defensive cyber. Uh, it turns out that, that cybersecurity and the cyber landscape changes from day to day, from hour to hour. There are new attacks constantly, new actors and new vulnerabilities discovered. The, the impact that has on cyber defense is that you can't find just one thing and then be good for a year or a month or sometimes even a week. We have to do continuous R&D and, and integrate our, the results of our R&D into the cyber defense life cycle. It needs to be fast. Second, well, we're using machine learning to do all this, to do this continuous R&D, to do this learning because computers can, can process way, way faster than humans. 
turns out that humans can actually understand what's going on in the network better, but we are super slow. So if we can use machine learning to bridge the gap between human smarts and machine speed, then maybe we can detect and remediate threats in hopefully real time, like before they have a chance to do any damage. The second bit of this is we really want to explain why our machine learning models um, believe or think or report something as anomalous or threatening. Having a model tell us, oh, like this, this particular network event where this host or this user or this service is threatening, that's, that's actually a phenomenal result. But sometimes it's not clear why the, the machine learning model thinks that or why it's telling you that answer. So the explanation of what the model believes or why it gave that answer is critical to help cyber analysts understand and make better judgments about the threats on the network. This machine learning work is leveraging the DoD's High Performance Computing Modernization Program resources with our high performance computing, our high performance storage, and high performance networking, along with the investments in the, the AI and ML subject matter experts. So the next thing we're gonna do is network attacks happen all over the place. Uh, they happen at, at network operation centers, they happen at your home, they happen both in large and small places. Well, what that means is that since threats and attacks and malicious behavior can happen everywhere, we really need to put our analysis as close to the network edge as possible. So the Peacock project is going to place high performance edge servers at key communications points. So we can do this real time detection and reporting and analysis to help the analysts respond faster in the event of a threat. And then we have this, let's say we have some really cool analysis. We've learned some interesting things and our models are actually detecting interesting things like things that network analysts want to know about that help them make networks more secure. Well, if we spent all this time doing this analysis, that doesn't mean that analysts can see it easily. So then Peacock is working to integrate the results of our analysis into larger platforms that integrate, um, that integrate data sources from, from other people, uh, from other services and sources into a more holistic picture. And then last, our, our models might be the best in the world, but uh, it'd be nice if they were the best in the world. Um, but if they can't be understood by the actual people securing the networks, they're essentially useless. So what we have to do is do our, do our modeling, do our training, do our analysis, our, our analysis, our test and our validation, and then get the feedback from the actual analysts who are looking at these things. And they, and they will tell us, oh, these results are good. These are bad. I don't understand this. Can you, well, this, like, this shows up as threatening, but it's actually not. And then we, so we repeat that, that cycle of improvement, test, validation, deployment until we have something that, that works for everybody and is integrated well and responds in real time. So the Peacock project is focused on anomaly detection which is a little bit different from let's call them classical, um, classical threat detection techniques. There are two major, um, two major ways to look for cyber threats. One is with common tactics, techniques, and procedures, where you know a particular technique is used to try to breach a system or escalate access or move within a network or there are some signatures of malicious behavior or files, executables, or, or traffic. There are quite a lot of, of signature-based uh, products out there that work extremely well, extraordinarily well. Um, uh, like I can't, I can't understate how important these products are. They work phenomenally well. But of course, they can't catch everything. Uh, what if there's a brand new zero day? Like there is no signature for something that has just been invented. And in that case, we might look at the, the Peacock project is looking for anomaly detection methods where we don't know precisely what we're looking for, but it's odd. Like it's something that we don't expect to see. It's, it's an outlier. It's significantly different than whatever else is happening in the network. 
And with machine learning, there's, there's at least two different ways to look at this. One is with supervised methods, where we have a data set that we know is, is anomalous, and that's the thing we want to detect on. The second thing is with unsupervised methods, where we don't precisely know, we don't have any data with, with answers of, oh, this is, this is bad and this is good. But um, by looking at the complete picture, at the landscape of the data we're seeing of things happening on the network, we can say, oh, like this communication is a little odd. Like it's, it, the hosts are odd or the time of day is odd or it's using a non-standard port or it's sending way more data than all this other communication has. Those unsupervised methods are what we're focusing on in this work. And the two things that we're going to cover today are the local outlier factor and isolation force, two different methods of detecting anomalies in a data source. So let's talk about explaining models. Uh, we're going to come back to the local outlier factor in isolation forest, um, but to motivate some of this work and, and to develop an intuition about it, we need to think about feature importance. And the best way to do this is with cats and dogs. Now the internet is the best generator of pictures of cats and dogs that the world has ever known. There will probably be no better generator of pictures of cats and dogs. In the machine learning community, um, uh, it turns out that Google and Facebook really, really like identifying things that are in pictures. It might be a person's face, might be a dog or a cat or a species or a tree or leaves. There's, there, there's phenomenal value in taking pictures and being able to tell what's in them. Um, it turns out humans are actually pretty good at that. So what we're trying to do is take some of our human smarts and put them into the machine so that the machine can look at any picture and tell us what's in it. Now, when you're first starting out in machine learning or in computer vision, uh, you, take, you typically take some canned um, trainings and you try to replicate some results to tell pictures of cats from pictures of dogs. So what we do is we train our model with a bunch of pictures of cats and pictures of dogs, and then we do some validation on it. We shove one picture through the model and we see the answer. It comes out as a cat. And then we shove in a picture of a dog and it comes out as a dog. And we're feeling pretty good about ourselves right now because our model has actually learned some things. And then we take the next thing in our validation set, which happens to be a black cat, and it for some reason comes out as a dog. Anybody who has trained a computer vision model has done this exact same thing. You put in something that is clearly a cat or a dog or whatever, and out comes the wrong answer. What we want to know is why is that answer wrong? Why did the model that we trained, that we spent so much time training and developing, why did it give us the wrong answer? Many models today are black boxes. They, they, you give them some input and they give you some output and you can't introspect into the model to figure out what it learned, why it gave you that answer, especially in the case of wrong answers. And um, if we could poke into the model, what we could see is that in this particular model learned that orange fur means that the animal is a cat and otherwise it's a dog. So brown fur, pink fur, bald things, they're all dogs. And the reason it thinks that is maybe because we gave it only pictures of orange cats. So it learned the simplest representation of what's a cat and what's a dog. Turned out to be a little bit incorrect. And this is where the feature importance really comes into play, is if we could look inside that model and see what the model thinks is important, what, what data points that the model believes discriminate between cats and dogs, then we can actually explain some of the answers. And that's going to, when we, when we apply this into the cyber domain, uh, it's really going to help our, our cyber analysts understand what the models are doing and why, and what they're good at and what they're bad at. So fe evaluating feature importance is gonna help us do, uh, do two main things. One is tell us if the trained model is making sense. And second, what happens when results are wrong or why are results wrong? Now, explainability has been well studied, and there, there are quite a few very interesting uh, algorithms and, and ways to look at models in uh, a general purpose sense. 
we are going to focus on, in, in this table, the lower right quadrant of model-specific local methods. And model-specific and local methods are of critical importance to us because in cybersecurity, uh, there may be one event out of a billion is malicious or threatening. Now, one event out of a billion is not very much data to work with. So we really need that anomaly detection. Um, but in our unsupervised methods, we have to throw all billion things into the model so that it can learn what's normal. We don't care what the model really learns about all of our normal stuff, our 999 million things. We care about that one in a billion, that, that odd one. Um, I don't want to know what the model thinks is, is common or normal for this thing. I, I care about why is this one in a billion event, like what about this one makes it, makes it threatening, makes it malicious, makes it anomalous. So to, to make a model specific local explanation of results, we need to understand our algorithms a little bit. And here we'll cover our local outlier factor and then our isolation force, just a, um, a short explanations of what they're doing and what we should expect from them. So the local outlier factor is a distance-based method that looks at a regional density of points or, or local density of points. On this slide, we have, we have four points, black, orange, purple, and red. Um, on the left side, we see that the black, orange, purple, and red are all pretty close to each other. The nearest neighbors all have the same distance from each other. All of those events, all those data points are about the same. There's nothing particularly anomalous about any one of those things because they're all, um, they're all grouped together. They have the same distances from each other. They look pretty normal. On the right side, we have still have those four points, the orange, red, purple, and black. But the black one is a lot farther away from its nearest neighbors than, uh, than, than the orange, red, and purple are from each other, from their nearest neighbors. What that implies to us is that the black point is kind of anomalous. It's, since it's so much farther away, um, since its average distance to its neighbors is much bigger than the average distance of those neighbors to their nearest neighbors, that black point is probably an outlier. It's probably anomalous. And this distance measure tells us how anomalous it is. To get this local explainability of a model, uh, digging into the actual algorithm of how these scores are generated is pretty important. So we run through some of the math and look at some of the definitions of local reachability, density, um, reachability, distance, cardinality of the, of the neighborhood of our group. And then with this understanding of what's going on and using a simple L1 or L2 norm for the distance calculation, we can understand how each individual point or each individual feature of, of the network event contributes to the total score. So first we calculate the outlier score how anomalous is a point using just normal local outlier factor. And then we can dig into the trained model, um, shove our anomalous event through the model again, and determine which features of that event contributed the most to this score. So we need at least a couple of algorithms. An isolation forest is another one that we've chosen. Um, it, is not, uh, it is not distance based. Um, which makes it significantly different. And that's, I believe that's important for, for uh, starting to develop an ensemble of models to help us flesh out a whole picture of anomalous behavior. In the isolation forest, we make the assumption that since outliers are few and pretty different, uh, maybe what we can do is take random splits, random orthogonal partitions in the space and maybe isolate the outliers very easily. Um, if we take random partitions um, across, across one or more or all of the dimensions, we can see how easy it is to isolate an individual point. The stranger, the more anomalous an individual point is, the easier it should be to isolate with random partitions. 
So in this figure on slide seven, there's a there's a, a group, a cluster of points in the middle, and there are some there are some anomalous ones on the outside. The ones that are by themselves are very easy to isolate, and the ones in the middle are much, much harder to isolate. So if we take these random partitions in the space, things that take, say, five or ten partitions to isolate are, are probably pretty normal. Things that take one or two partitions to isolate are probably pretty anomalous. To explain our isolation forest models, we started with the depth-based isolation forest feature importance algorithm, Diffie for short. Diffie's insight was that uh, to, explain, to explain an isolation forest, um, what matters is the imbalance between the splits and the depth of the tree. The deeper we go in the tree, the more, uh, the more normal a point is. The shallower we go in the tree, or the more, um, the more the data is imbalanced in the tree, the more anomalous a point is. So with that insight, if we want to explain how important an individual feature is for a score, we definitely need to track both the imbalance of the data set from the random partitions from our algorithm and how deep we have gone into the tree to isolate this individual point. And there's, there's, some, uh, there's a little bit of math here that shows how we can calculate the imbalances and based on the depth. Uh, and again, the number of inliers and outliers and the number of splits in the tree. But that's just a whole bunch of math. It turns out that the, that the raw Diffie algorithm isn't quite suitable for our desire for a local measure. It is algorithm specific, but it's more, uh, but Diffie is more of a global method. Um, so what we explored is trying to uh, make modifications to Diffie so that we can get this local measure so we can determine the one in a billion uh, malicious event explanation. So we start with Diffie and we eliminate some things and we can, turns out we can just count some things. And maybe if we do something like, oh, let's just count the number of times a feature is used for a single point uh, based on leaf nodes and leaf sizes, maybe that will do a pretty good job. And then there's some other things we can do. Um, maybe with this lambda term, we can either ignore it or turn it into the depth or the leaf depth, or there, there's quite a few things. Um, we don't know enough about what actually happens in our models uh, to be able to say one way or the other yet before we have done some experimental validation on it for the explanation. So let's do a little bit of validation. First, we start with some synthetic data. We tightly control this. We know precisely what the anomalies, the outliers are, and, and what's normal. We started with just six dimensional data, uh, not too big, not too small. Um, four of the dimensions are, are drawn from a uniform distribution, two are taken from a normal distribution. And it's the two normal distributions that, that really are going to make things anomalous for us. And we can know precisely what is in and what is out from our data set. So we take some of this data and we run it through our algorithms, our local local outlier factor explanation and our local Diffie methods. So if we take our synthetic data and do some global explanations on it, we find that our local outlier factor methods work perfectly. Um, every single thing that is an outlier is identified as such, and everything that is an inlier or not anomalous is also identified as such. Perfect. Um, if only life were as easy as synthetic data. Our isolation forest also did quite well. And when we look at uh, our, our normalized feature importance based on a, on a per dimension basis, we find that our local methods actually did quite well. They did, they did a good job identifying which features, which the, the two normal um, distributions, which features uh, made an event anomalous or not. And we did a little bit of comparison with some of the, the uh, model agnostic and 
global explanations with pimp and lime and shop. With the exception of lime, um, in this particular example, they all did quite well. But uh, they are not model specific, which was important to us. And uh, they're not necessarily local explanations, which is also important to us. So synthetic data is nice. It helps us do some just very basic validation of, of, our, of our thoughts, of our algorithms, of our implementation. But we don't have synthetic data in the real world. So how does this work on something we've actually captured? On this slide, we have Kerberos records, which are for authentication. And it turns out that uh, on the rightmost column of the red and the blue tables, we have our scores, which have been which have been scaled so they're they're in a nice range that analysts can understand. But we have some high scores, like a 7.9 and a 5.5. What we want to know is, based on all of the things we have in our in our Kerberos logs, why did this one event? Why is it scored a 7.9 or a 5.5? Um, can our can our local outlier factor in isolation forest explanations give us some insight into why these particular events um, are, are thought to be anomalous? So when we apply our algorithms and shop and lime to some of these highest scored things, we see that our isolation forest doesn't think anything in particular is very strange. Um, there's no, like, maybe it's timestamp, not particularly strange, or the originating host, or the port, or the destination host, um, or the destination port. Our local outlier factor uh, explanation believes that the, the destination host explains 99% of the variation or uh, of the anomalousness of this particular event. And that, um, that, that's, a, that's a pretty interesting result. That particular result, um, that explanation is going to be sent to the analyst for, for someone who understands the network to look at, who understands the network and, and this particular Kerberos um, authentication setup for them to evaluate, oh, like, is this host actually weird or is it not? And if it's not, they can feed it back to us and say, no, you need to, you need to downweight these or make it so that you know that, that this particular host or this particular network is okay for us to, is, is okay for Kerberos. So explaining, explaining an individual authentication record with Kerberos is very nice. It gives the analysts hooks to start somewhere fast. Um, it, can, it can help them accelerate their searches and their analysis. But what if we make 10,000 of these uh, anomaly scores um, every day and report and analyze all those 10,000 scores? Is that global structure of all the 10,000, is that good? Um, do we need to make different cutoffs for what we explain and report or, or do we not? Since our algorithms are unsupervised, they can basically always give us a score from zero to infinity in the case of local outlier factor or like zero to one in the case of the isolation forest. But where do we make that cutoff to help the analysts determine when things are anomalous enough to look at? And second, if we're reporting these things, how can we tell the analysts some of the more global structures? What does this model typically learn? What does this model often think are important? Some of the global explanations will be useful for when they analyze, oh, this particular, the isolation forest is good for web traffic and email traffic. It's not so good for Kerberos traffic. Um, those global explanations will help them, will help them refine and understand possibly some of the biases that have been learned by the models. And what we see in our, in our normalized feature importance is that the two models actually learn that different features have significantly different importance um, based on the algorithm used and the scores and the distribution of scores. In this work, we've, we've looked at, can we explain things in a useful way? 
so that actual cyber analysts can have can have better information, can start their searches faster, can do their analysis faster. Um, we have developed some new tools that do explain why a machine learning model thinks a network event is anomalous. We've we've shown and demonstrated through some feedback loops that local methods are actually useful. Understanding why a one in a million or one in a billion event is is flagged as anomalous is incredibly useful to analysts. But it turns out that we don't know which one is actually the most useful yet. And so those global methods of oh, what do these models tend to learn and report is is uh, critical for the analysts to to understand the bias and and the goodness of the model's domain. What uh, what we're going to do in the future, what we've been working on, is still verifying these results, um, continuous feedback from analysts so that we can keep tuning our models from, from uh, feature weighting, um, feature engineering, feature selection, and developing new methods for new algorithms. Since we have a distance-based method and a graph-based one or a tree-based one, are there some other things, other techniques and models that we can use to complement them that are, that are different enough uh, to help us flesh out the rest of our ensemble? And we are doing continuous improvement uh, based on two-week iterative cycles based on analyst feedback uh, to help us uh, incrementally, step-by-step, -step, uh, achieve, achieve our goals of understandable by the analyst, understandable by the system, fast and reportable for remediations. In conclusion, uh, what the Peacock Project is trying to, to achieve are, are fast analysis of network, um, integration with, with global systems for situational awareness and response, local explanations of, of individual network events that might be anomalous or threatening, and integrating these the results of these analysis into comprehensive systems. What we have shown is some new methods for feature importance and model explanation to help analysts accelerate their analysis and get and get a foundation to start from individually identified network threats. We've shown some global methods for what models are are good at particular things with our edge systems deployed at, at the network edge where attacks are, are coming in constantly, we can do fast analysis. And then integrating the results of those analysis, those explanations and the global uh, methods back to the, the, the integrated platforms for the, that the analysts use every day to do their work, to better secure networks and remediate things. What we don't know yet is which of our models is, is better for analysts? Where are the weaknesses and the strengths? And that's why we've established these two week iterative cycles so that we can improve our models based on feedback and bring the analysts more up to speed, more comfortable with, with what our models are telling them to secure their networks. Thank you for coming to this session.